Recently, I sent you a book through Amazon that I was hoping you would read, and I'm assuming that's the next book on your reading list, right? No. <laughs> I've got no. one ahead of that. Sorry. I'm not going to buy you any more gifts. <laughs> <laughs> no, no you, sent it, you sent it to me via Amazon, and I think I have to download it onto my, uh, my Kindle app. Wait, you haven't even downloaded it? I haven't even downloaded oh it. Oh, my it's, goodness. You're just trying to – see, it, the reason I haven't is because it's a productivity book and you're trying to get me to be more productive, but I haven't read it yet, so I'm not as productive as I could be. <laughs> right. You see the excuse thing going on here? Yeah, uh, that's yeah, productivity is one of those things that I should, <clears throat> I'm sure everybody's like, Joe's terrible at getting stuff done. This, this book I'm holding up for those that are on the YouTube channel. Thank you for being on the YouTube channel, by the way. You're awesome. This is the book I'm currently reading. It's called The Take Action Effect by Scott Volker, a friend of ours. And uh, we just had him on the podcast. And that's what the book is all about. It's a combination of, and this is why I'm not reading the book you sent me. And I have one more in front of that, by the way. But this one is amazing. It's really, it's telling Scott's story. Uh, Scott, uh, as a lot of people know, has a podcast called The Amazing Seller Podcast. With the audience he has every month, he could fill up Bank of America Stadium here in, uh, in Charlotte. And I think that's like 25, 30,000 people. Um, he started out just telling his story, uh, building an Amazon business and everything he was going through. He just laid it all out, out on the line. He's really trans, uh, transferred himself or transformed himself into someone that is first and foremost helping people um, take action in their lives. And he talks about this in the book and how he did certain things in his life and what an impact it had uh, and what it led to next and next and next and now where he's at. Uh, running a you know a, a seven figure business with the lifestyle that he wants. It's the, one of the most th important things about Scott and the book and the action steps that he shows people how to take is to run a business, set your own goals, how to set goals properly with vision boards and different things, uh, but with the lifestyle that you want. This is not a get rich quick scheme. It's a book to build the life that you want, how to take certain steps and actions, um, and if you want to run a 10, 20, 30, 40, $50 million business, great. These, this will help. And there's some examples of that, of people that have, are doing that. Um, but if you want to just earn an extra couple thousand dollars on the side uh, and build the business slowly, there's absolutely some steps in there for those folks as well. People that are listening now that still have full-time jobs, that don't dare buy a business because they have to quit their job or the, things of that nature. If they're gonna build a business, um, this allows them to take certain steps and actions to do that and build a safe business that's going to be relatively passive that they could do part time uh, as they build that up and eventually quit their day job or sell it through Quiet Light. Right. You know, one of the things I, I like about this is the idea of having a purpose to what you're doing. You know, I think there's this tendency to chase success, chase success, chase success. And we put in our, our minds that success is a certain business goal while we ignore the other aspects of our life. And uh, I know, you know, over the past 13 years of running Quiet Life Brokerage, I've run across so many successful entrepreneurs who have built amazing businesses, but frankly are somewhat miserable uh, because they've built prisons for themselves. And we talk about why are people selling? Sometimes it's just because they, they've built that prison of a business and they need to get out and they realize that they need to readjust their life priorities. Um, I love when we meet people like Scott, like Ezra Firestone, and some of these other guys that have reached certain levels of success. And now what they're doing is they're really trying to just be helpful and really contribute to that entrepreneurial community uh, with some of the lessons they've learned. And I love the focus of this book. I love that it's, it's a system out there to help you identify what's really important and have everything else flow into that. You know, set the real goals out there and build uh, that system, including the business, that fits those goals. And it's just that. Scott is a, is a real guy giving real life examples of uh, things that he's done and, and the path that he's taken. Uh, and he's giving real advice here that is, you know, action oriented. And it's a mindset, it's inspiration, and there's steps to take as well. It's one of the best books I've read in 2019. I highly recommend everybody uh, take a listen to the podcast and at the end uh, and in the show notes here, 
Um, you can go to uh, Take Action Effect and uh, and download or buy the book. It's uh, available. I, he w- he went he went further than our own very own Walker Dibble, and he made it avail- available uh, in the audio version as well. Oh, Walker needs to step his game up and uh, <laughs> start recording. Uh, no, uh, fantastic. Let's get to this episode here. I, I love introducing our audience to people that we find to be good friends uh, of Quiet Light because they share some of our mission and purpose. Uh, so I'm excited to share this episode with everybody. Let's get to it. Shannon, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Um, I know you and I have just recently met, but I'm really, really excited about this conversation because you and I talked only briefly. I, I think we talked just for a little bit on the phone and in just about 10 minutes, you opened my eyes to some awesome strategies that sellers can use to reduce their tax burdens. And look, I've, I've dealt with so many sellers who go to their accountants and say, what is my tax burden? Oh, here's what it's going to be, you know, 22% or whatever of cap gains tax. And I said, well, what can I do to reduce that? They're like, it really can't suck it up and pay for it. And you're like, yeah. no, that, that's yeah. not the case. Exactly. So let's start out with a, just kind of a quick introduction of yourself. Uh, why don't you tell everyone um, who you are, the firm you work for, and kind of what your mission is. Yeah, so I am the chief strategist here at Advanced Accounting, and we are a little bit different than your average uh, tax professional. We actually do proactive tax planning for our clients, and so what we do is we want to help you mitigate those taxes before you actually have an occurrence of a sale. And then even on the back end, we can help you after you've actually sold the company as well. That's not as as, uh, advantageous for you, but we really like to be proactive, and that's what we're going to talk about today is how do we after we've, you know, hopefully made a profit on the sale of our business, how do we keep the IRS from getting a slice of our hard work legally? Legally, right? Now, that's the big thing. <laughs> you know, my eyes were open on a recent transaction that, that we did here at Quiet Light. In fact, we had uh, Joseph on, who was the seller in that case. And it was a little bit of a different deal because he was a UK-based seller. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we brought in a tax specialist on that deal who ended up saving gobs of money. I mean, significant amount, uh, significant amounts of money from him uh, from a tax perspective. And so to be able to talk to, to someone like you um, who does this uh, as a specialty is going to be really exciting. So let's, let's start off real quick with this. And um, just a point that I know you, you made to me uh, before our call here, which is whenever there's money changing hands, the IRS wants a slice of it, right? They're going to get something of it. Um, what would you say to the tax professionals that are saying, just suck it up and pay it? Yeah, you know, I actually was talking to a tax professional the other day and he was like, well, nothing's certain in life but death and taxes and just be thankful you're not dealing with death. And I, and he said, you know, there's a cap on capital gains. And I was like, um, right, there is a cap on capital gains after the seller, you know, sells his company. But there's actually a way that we can mitigate taxes, reduce them dramatically and sometimes even eliminate them, which is like, everyone's like, excuse me, how can that possibly? Yeah, excuse work? me, wait, we can eliminate taxes on the sale. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm intrigued. That, yeah, I, you know, you've caught my attention now. And of course, you know, one of the things that when we're looking at the IRS code, there was a senator that once I, I heard quote that the first nine pages of the IRS code is all about the definition of what is income. And then the rest of the code is just a web of, um, you know, Uh, preferences and deductions and how to actually work the code and work income. And so when we're talking about tax planning, that's what we're talking about really being proactive so that we're not getting the, you know, the tax professional who just says, oh, you just got to suck it up and deal with it. You know, you're going to pay capital gains and don't worry about it. It's cost of doing business. And that's not the truth. It's not, you know, taxes can be legally mitigated. And if you have enough knowledge, um, that knowledge is power and can really put more money into your pocket. All right. So the first nine pages just define what income is. Do you know how large the tax code is? How many pages? You know what? After the new revision, I really don't know. I think (laughs) that it's thousands and thousands of pages. (laughs) So there's a lot in there. And, you know, I met with uh, some tax professionals personally uh, recently for just my own uh, benefit. And we went over that conversation with them, which was, uh, hey, look at all the things that you're basically handing over to the government where legally you don't have to if you're doing these different things. And it's more than any one of us can really de- decipher on our own, right? Because I don't have time to sit there and read and then stay up to date on all of this. Um, 
All right, so where do we and start? I, and, and I don't mean to bash any type of tax professional because keeping a, a taxpayer in compliance in, in and of itself is a full-time job. So what we're doing is really, a is really by being proactive, this is a specialty from that standpoint. So I think the first thing that we start about is we talk about how does, it how does, how does capital gains really work? Because that's what happens when you sell your business. You actually have a capital gain. So the, the methodology is buy low and sell high and pay the tax on the difference. And that, that's the whole concept really in nine words, but really taxes are never just as easy as just the, that, you know, buy low and sell high. Um, the first thing that you have to understand is what your basis is. And basis basically is what did I actually purchase my business for? Or what did I invest into my business? Sometimes we call it original basis or adjusted basis. So basically it's just anything I paid for the asset and anything I added to it. So we have to understand what our basis is when we ever go into a sale. In fact, the IRS has a 13 page document just on basis. So you can, if you're really excited about basis, you can read, you know, the 13 page uh, document on. I, I, can, I, I can say I, I haven't been really excited about it, but I am now. <laughs> <laughs> right? well, how would you do, uh, and maybe I'm jumping ahead. How would you deal with basis in a startup situation? So basically a lot of, so a lot of service-based businesses are going to have zero basis. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we deal with on a regular basis is that there is no basis. You know, you started an Amazon business and you really have no assets to speak of. And so unfortunately, your basis is zero. Okay, what, what can you count as part of basis? What, what qualifies as that? So, so equipment would qualify if you purchased a building, if you, um, you know, sometimes depending on the business, it could be um, that you've added furniture and fixtures and things of that nature. What about things like molds for those that are uh, making their own products? Exactly. So anything, anything like that. So anything like if you have a mold or sometimes depending on the patent, copyrights, things of that nature can be the basis if you're actually transitioning into another business. For those that are not in e-commerce, let's talk about like a content site. A lot of content sites are uh, start out by hiring a bunch of writers to build kind of a foundational Mm -hmm. uh, amount of content on their site. And that can be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of content being written. W could that qualify for basis? It could. It depends on how it was expensed. So sometimes uh, accountants can be creative in the way that they're expensing things. So really basically when we're getting ready to do a sale, we have to look at the balance sheet and determine what's been depreciated. So basically if you're depreciating it, then that's part of your basis. If it's just been completely, so if you've, if you've hired a copywriter and, and you've expensed that, then it's not going to be considered basis. Oh, I get it. And this is one of those things, we talk about this all the time on this podcast. We talk about making sure you understand your own financials. And so many entrepreneurs are really weak in this area. When you look at the balance sheet as this kind of cryptic uh, report where we don't really understand it. And then there's also this, this idea of, well, I want to expense as much as I can reduce my income tax yeah. burden. Um, but this is looking at it a little bit different. So if, if I were to, to start up a content site mm -hmm. uh, and I, I realized, look, I'm going to invest $50,000 into uh, seed content. Mm -hmm. You're saying, look, from you might initially, like initially I might not be making any money anyways. So mm -hmm. maybe it's better to put that in and record that as an asset investment that I can depreciate. Right, and see, and that's one of the things you always want to think about the end in, in mind. You always kind of want to like look at what is the, how what is my exit strategy? At, even when you're starting a business, you want to look at what your exit strategy is to determine. And in those you know, in those early years, I mean, most businesses in the first three to five years are not really making a huge profit. And so I, I look at different expenses, and really a lot of those can be capitalized over time instead of just expensed in that year. And that's something to take a look at. And that's why our proactive planning and understanding your financials becomes so important. Yeah, now from a buying standpoint, if you're acquiring a business, um, obviously you're, you're gonna capitalize the expense of investing in that business right away, right? That's gonna right. be an investment. So that's gonna form basis, but then also things that you're doing right after uh, as well. Correct, so anything that's gonna be adding value, capital value to that business is something that you're gonna to wanna to kind of look at and see, is it something that we should, is it really truly an expense or is it actually adding a capital value to the underlying business and should be depreciated over time? 
Okay, so how does this shake out on a sale uh, basis? Oh, I would know we buy uh, buy low, sell high. Yeah, I imagine there's a simple subtraction coming up here, right? <laughs> right. So I mean, so basically, the difference between the sale price and your basis is where you're going to pay capital gains, but only, and you're not only going to pay capital gains. Depending on your filing status, you're also maybe getting hit with something called net investment income tax. And that's a new tax um, underneath the Obama administration where they're going to kick in a 3.8% tax for those that are $200,000 of adjusted gross income for individuals and $250,000 for um, joint filers. And so back, basically, you're going to hit with capital gains and that net investment um, income tax. And so that can be pretty hefty. And so one of the things when we're talking about mitigating taxes on the sale of a business pre-planning becomes very important. And one of the things is that if we have enough time before the sale of the business, there's a lot of planning we can do. I mean, there's a few after the sale offsets that we can, we can kind of, you know, um, facilitate to, to mitigate tax, but it's nothing like the time before the sale. And one of the things is we're going to talk about several different strategies it's really important to understand that we actually need to start our planning. There cannot be a binding contract. And you're going to see me say, repeat this again. There cannot be a binding contract in place when we start this pre-planning. So this, what a binding contract, again, from a sales standpoint, we're looking at LOI, which is usually non-binding, but then there's purchase agreements, which are going to be binding. Correct. Exactly. So we even like there to be, no LOI and we want no question by mm -hmm. any type of, of, of government organization or court system. So we even tell our clients, even before there's an LOI, we want to have our planning done. So oftentimes when people come to you as a, a, to sell their business, they know they're going to sell their business. That's the goal. And so that's when the planning should start right then and there. Right. And we preach all the time that if you want to sell your business, it's best if you're actually planning 12 to 24 months in advance. Because from, from our standpoint, we want the, those other metrics that we look at that influence the valuation to be as optimized as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would imagine this pre-tax planning would also benefit uh, if you're 12, 24 months out. Well, definitely, because there's a lot that we can actually do in the current years to help them mitigate taxes, but then on the sale of the business, definitely. Now, the quickest we've done, we can do this is 60 to 90 days. But one of the things I found is that what we have to do is we actually have to educate our seller on these strategies because a confused mind always says no. And one of the things we want to make sure is that our, our clients understand what they're doing and why, why they're doing it, what the advantages and disadvantages are. So we really start an education process with them so that they understand exactly, like they could sit down and explain exactly the transaction that's about to happen in their own words. And, and, and have that confidence. Right, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so let's, let's get into the, the example of a transaction here uh, because let's say that we're, we're uh, knowing that we're going to sell the business, uh, we're getting into this uh, here and we've already said, okay, let's, let's, we've got maybe a little bit of basis, but we still have a pretty large delta on what we're selling for versus what our basis is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe we've been able to form 50, maybe $100,000 basis, but if you're selling a business for $1.5, $2 million, mm -hmm. you know, the savings is kind of nominal on that uh, that side. Where else should we be looking at, uh, at here? Maybe, I know we talked a little bit about long-term and uh, short-term capital gains taxes mm -hmm. uh, in our uh, pre-call uh, stuff. How does this play into this? Well, I think one of the things is when we start to look at the fact that we have a capital gain, and that's what we really want, we have to really immediately step in and say, okay, what are the strategies that I can do to mitigate these taxes? So one of the strategies, and we usually use a combination of strategies. So I, I know you and I are going to kind of break down just the simplified strategies, but oftentimes they're actually uh, strategies that are interwoven together from that standpoint. So one of the strategies we often see is something called an installment sale. And an installment sale is just simply a sale where you receive payments in installments in more than one year. And so basically what that means is you sell your business in year one and you agree to take three equal installments over a three-year period. Now, that works with some people. Um, the advantages are that you're going to defer the gain until you actually receive those payments. The, you know, so taxes is divided 
you know, throughout the years. So for an example, we just did a transaction where let's say you have a business that you bought for 600,000 and you sold it for a million. So 40% of your sale is a gain. Mm -hmm. So when you receive those installment payments over the years, 40% of each of those installment is going to be taxed as capital gain. So why is that important? So a couple of different reasons. It's going to actually, if you split out the capital gains over three years or five years, you actually reduce your, the, the overall taxation that you're, you know, you're absorbing from that standpoint. Um, and so you're not getting stuffed all in one year with a huge, big, you know, big tax bill, you know, but the devil's in the details with that one, because not all assets are going to qualify for an installment sale. So that's one thing to remember. Um, so anything that's publicly traded is not going to qualify for, a, uh, an asset sale. Um, you also have to, a lot of times we find that, you know, buyers and sellers want to get a really, really low rate interest rate. And so you can't, um, you have to charge adequate interest to the person who's buying. Um, and if you sell depreciated, depreciated assets, so let's say you're selling equipment, you have to recapture all of that depreciation and pay ordinary income tax rates immediately. So there's some things where an installment sale works really, really well with, and sometimes it's not gonna work really well. But that's one of the simple strategies that we see. Now, one of the problems with that is that you're going to get your you're going to get your income over a few years. Sometimes it's a big deal, and I actually sent you an example earlier, and we can talk about that in a few minutes. Where our buyer actually got his money over five years, and that worked out perfectly. We were actually able to eliminate the taxation on that. And we're going to talk about that because that's huge. Um, and he was getting you know he was getting over two million dollars a year, so he was pretty happy, you know. Right, right. So it, real quick, it, are you able to reduce the effective rate by doing an installment sale? Uh, obviously, the amount that you're paying in one, one payment is going to be reduced, but do you, are you able to reduce that rate? It does. It, it, we're able to, and it depends on the taxpayer's adjusted gross income, but we are able to reduce the net effective taxes over the period. And okay. oftentimes when we're talking about that, sometimes depending on the, sale, the, the, the amount of the sale or the amount of the, of the proceeds, we're able to even get, you know, payments five to 10 years out so that we're able to keep that kind of make a, an individual pension for that person. And, um, and that way they can also do things like delay social security and, and keep their taxes down. And so it really becomes a very much, not just a, a planning for the sale event, but planning for the next few years of what happens with those proceeds. All right. So I, I already know what most of my clients are going to say with this, which is I don't want to defer my payments because what happens if they don't pay um, uh, on that? How, what are my collection options? What are, you know, there's always this worry, especially with internet uh, acquisitions where so much of the, the business is wrapped up in blue sky, goodwill, yep. non-tangible assets. And so what happens if, if the buyer runs the business into the ground two years from now, and they still have, you know, a $400,000 payment. Well, what are my options? So could you yeah. escrow those funds up front and pay them out? So one of the things you could do is actually do a structured sale. Okay. And that actually brings in a third party. Okay. Okay. So a structured sale is, is sometimes um, very advantageous because it actually takes the installment sale tax treatment um, it does require a buyer to pay a little bit of cash up front or all of the cash up front, okay? So basically what, what you're doing with a structured sale is you're bringing in a third party and you're exchanging your business for a stream of income. So basically what happens is you, um, and, and let me say this is appropriate for businesses between the 100,000 and the $5 million, okay? So if you're over 5 million, it's, it, it would not work this way, but basically, in a structured sale, you're going to negotiate a traditional sale. Your buyer is going to assign their obligation to make payments to an independent third party. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lender involved here or an insurance company involved here. And then that third party is going to take that cash. And so you never actually get receipts. So we avoid constructive receipt rules, which would actually make, if we actually took that money in our hand immediately, that would make it taxable immediately. So then the third party now has your, your cash and they're going to buy you something like an immediate annuity to start income to you immediately. So you pay taxes on 
as you receive those payments over the years, you're gonna pay taxes on the capital gains, again, defer it, but this is a way to bring a third party in, it's called a structured sale, in order to help mitigate some of that, that risk. Okay, so who is this third uh, party company? Like what, what would be some examples of these third party companies? So it could be a lender, it could be an insurance company. There are third parties that actually facilitate deals like this. Okay, and then from the seller standpoint, the benefit here is that they're not having to act as a collector of funds. You have the third party that's doing that work. Correct, correct. And so here's, and so here's something that what we're seeing gain popularity is, so one of the downsides of the most installment sales, either a structured sale or an installment sale, is that you sold your business, you've deferred the tax, but you don't have all your money. Right. You have a stream of income, but you don't have all your money. And so one of the things that we have found is that, you know, if you're comfortable exchanging your equity in your business for just a stream of income, that's perfect if you don't need it all at one time. But oftentimes I find that entrepreneurs want to go do another venture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in their blood. They want to close one chapter and start a new chapter. And so that becomes, there becomes an issue because there's no capital to actually work with if, unless the sale is, you know, very large. So here, what we're finding is that we can take an installment sale and we can couple it with something called a monetizing loan. Now, this is a complicated concept. It takes months to actually really kind of, we do webinars and, and um, PowerPoints to really educate our clients on this. And, and we bring in the, the legal team to really ex explain this, but I'm gonna try to kind of be very simple in my explanation. What we do basically is we, we take an installment sale and we couple it with a monetizing loan. And so basically the way that this works is we're gonna defer the taxes for 30 years. Okay. okay. So basically you negotiate a sales price with your buyer, just like you would, okay? And when it comes time to close, there's gonna be simultaneous things that happen at closing. You're gonna sell your assets to an unrelated third party in exchange for a lump sum payment in 30 years. That's step one. That third party simultaneously sells your asset to the buyer in exchange for your agreed upon price. Now you've sold your asset, you're gonna use installment sale treatment to defer the tax, mm -hmm. but you still don't have your money. Okay? okay, here's where the monetizing loan comes in. At the same time that you and the third party and the buyer close the original sale, the third party lender is gonna step in and he's gonna to extend to you a loan equal to 93.5% of the sale. Okay. Okay. So remember, loan proceeds are not taxable because they come with an obligation to repay. Right. Now, you have your cash in your hand an amount almost equivalent to what you had for your sales price and you're free to do whatever you want with those funds. Now, it's a loan. While that loan is outstanding, the third party pays the interest. In fact, the terms of the loan specify that the interest is non-recourse to the seller, which is really important because non-recourse means that the lender can't come after you for the payment of that interest. So 30 years goes by, you have all of your money, you do whatever you want with it. And at the end of the 30 years, the whole transaction unwinds. The third party pays you or your heirs the purchase price in cash. You use the proceeds to repay the loan and then you pay the tax. So there's some magic that happens here. I always call it the eighth and ninth wonder of the world, tax <laughs> deferral and the time value of money. So the question really happens to be, what's gonna be the tax in 30 years? Right. So if inflation, so, if you think about this, if inflation continues at two and a half percent, that's kind of what it's been for the last 20 or 30 years. If it continues and long-term capital gains remains at 20%, the tax bill on a million dollars of gain in 2019 would be equivalent to about $94,000 in 2049. Wow. That's less than half of, the, of today's bill, tax bill, and you've got to use your money for 30 years. Right. So with this, with the installment sale and monetizing loan, you still get that money up front. It's just coming in a different vehicle. It's coming through 
uh, through essentially a loan, right? right? But that's that. Yeah, my mind is is spinning right now. And you said earlier, confused minds say no. Uh, <laughs> my head is a little bit confused right now, but I'm seeing where you're going with this. This is this is really really brilliant. What are some reasons why? people both on the buy side and sell side wouldn't want to do this other than confusion of the concept. Well, and you know what, really when I, when we actually walk, so oftentimes we get clients who are like right in the middle, like I've got a, I've got an LOI. I want to sign. I need to do something now. This structure takes a lot of time to explain and mm -hmm. to be comfortable with and to show how all of the numbers move. Okay. So really what are, what are the downsides of this? Um, Confusion, that's probably the number one thing or lack of understanding of how it can really, can this really work? Mm -hmm. I, mean, can, I mean, people are like, really defer taxes for 30 years. Um, they're skeptical of lenders sometimes that would actually be, um, you know, extending the loan. So there's a lot of skepticism, I think, and lack of understanding. But really, this is a win-win for everyone involved. I mean, really, the, the buyer doesn't care. The buyer is going to get his asset and he's going to walk away and he's going to have his new business. So the right. buyer they're, doesn't care. And they're, they're paying just as, as they normally would if they're buying yeah. the business up front, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the seller, sometimes they don't understand. Um, but I mean, there's legal agreements in place between the, the a rigor around the loan. I mean, it's a non, you, you know, you're making sure that you're working with a reputable third party um, from that standpoint. So you're making sure that um, you know, that the loan is non-recourse that, and how it's going to unwind. And of course, you're going to have your own attorney look at all of the documents and paperwork as well. I mean, so basically you're doing your own due diligence. Um, but any tax professional that's utilizing these kinds of strategies have done their own due diligence as well. And they're picking a third party to actually work with that and, and a lawyer or legal team to work with that, ha that that's what they specialize in. Right, right. Uh, how, how do you uh, handle this with more complex sales where you have a portion of like an equity rollover, cash up front, and maybe, you know, some uh, debt as well uh, coming yeah. in there? Can you structure uh, this as a component of a larger structure? Correct. So that's when I said we often use multiple strategies. So right now I'm working on a deal where someone is selling a re restaurant franchise along with the real estate that the, some of the franchise franchises sit on and there's debt. And so we're actually, we're, we're, we're actually restructuring debt to flow through um, like a different entity on the real estate side so that we can use a monetized installment sale. So we've got like three or four actual strategies that are in play and that's where the pre-planning comes in. So if we have 12 to 24 months to like sit down with you and figure out a game plan, we can really kind of put several different strategies together. Sometimes we're just deferring the tax. Sometimes we're able to eliminate it altogether, but it's just different components of the sale will be treated differently. All right. So I, I want to get to our example because uh, again, I can hear the question in people's minds, which is, is the juice worth the squeeze here, yeah. right? The fees to you, the amount of time, the headache, trying to convince a buyer to do this, which doesn't look as traditional as maybe uh, everyone is expecting going in. So let's run through an example here. And um, you sent me a PDF with an example. Is it okay if I post this on our site? Um, yes, definitely. Okay, so we'll, we'll make this available for download in the show notes so that people can uh, follow along with this if you want an actual example of this. But let's, let's talk through the example here yeah. uh, that, that you gave me. And this is just one. So this is just one strategy. So I just illustrated one. So this was actually a business that's being sold in Michigan. Equipment was included. So they had molds and dyes. Okay, mm -hmm. and they sold on the internet. So they are a combination business. So the sale price was twelve million dollars, and the cost um, of the sale was about three hundred sixty thousand. They had actually found a buyer outright, but this is what the legal team was was kind of charging. The, so the gain overall was eleven point six million dollars. So at the end of the day, you know, you'll see here underneath projected taxes, we have federal taxes, we have that net investment income tax, we also are recapturing depreciation, and then we have the state tax. So all in, there's, their total gain is 11.6 million, and they're losing $4.3 million to taxes. Yeah, I can tell you when I sold my business, it wasn't for $12 million, but when I sold my very first business, one of the most sobering moments was getting this first tax bill. And again, just to reiterate this, their taxable gain, so the cost of the sale on this 
We have $12 million of the sales price, 360,000 towards advisors and fees here. So 11.64 is what they're gaining after those advisory fees. And then the government at different levels comes in and says, thank you for that 11.6. We're taking 4.3 of that and reducing you down to what, 7.2, 7.3 million dollars. Yeah, so about 7.3 million dollars is what you're going to walk away with. Yeah. yeah. Which is so, not, I mean, that's not, you know, here's, that's a lot of money, but it can be a lot more. You're still buying dinner the next time you go out, but <laughs> right. when you look at 12 million and it gets reduced to 7.3, that's pretty, pretty hefty. So, so one of the things that, you know, and you'll look here is that we're able to increase his, this, this seller's profit by over $3.3 million. And so basically what we do is that you'll see here that the sale price didn't change, the net sales price didn't change. We're actually using a combination of different strategies and the, the buyer or the seller is actually taking payments over five years. Mm -hmm. So over a course of five years, you can get $2.1 million. And then there's some additional tax savings that we found in there over time. Um, so he's getting a little bit more um, cash flow from that standpoint. So after just coupling a couple of our strategies together, instead of walking away with 7.3 million, he walks away with 10.6. That's a huge gain. That's that uh, three point, uh, my math here is uh, three, $3.3 million. $3 .3 of additional. Million. A little bit more than 3.3 million. And because some of that money is deferred now with, with those deferred payments, um, you know, you mentioned briefly the time value of money. How do we capture some of that time value of money? So uh, with those deferred payments, I mean, basically um, you are actually getting a, you know, a little bit of an interest rate in that as well. So that that's all has to be inside the different strategies. Remember when I said we're, we're doing installment sales, we've got to charge interest and have interest and things of that nature. It has to be reasonable. It right. has to be reasonable. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, over five years, you're going to receive that, that $2.1 million, you know, so this person's giving up, they're, they're comfortable giving up a little bit of return on investment um, in order to actually eliminate the taxes. Yeah. And th that right there, I can totally see being worth the effort of, of going through this. And I know, you know, we, we talk to sellers all the time and they get so nervous about doing installment plans. They want their money. They want their money now. And for a lot of people, especially growing a business, right? They, they're, they're profit rich, but cash flow poor where they're showing good profits. Yeah. And the selling moment is the first time where they're really getting to cash out. They're of They're reaping their harvest. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, kind of a hard sell initially to say, okay, I know you're now selling your business for, you know, $12 million, but. Right. Well, and I think one of the things like the conversation I have with them when we propose these strategies, because they're, you know, one of the thing that we're looking at is, okay, you know, you're used to living on 250,000 a year in income. And now I'm going to get, you're going to get 2 million. What are you going to do with it? Yeah, but probably I mean, blow it. What's the difference if you, if, I, if you are given a check for, for seven, or you're giving a check for two. How is that going to change your day-to-day -day life? And so that it's a conversation right. you actually have to have. You have to have to understand what the what the seller's ultimate goal is. I mean, if it's just to go live on the beach in Delray, Florida, Delray Beach, Florida, that's kind of my dream, then you can probably do that for two million dollars a year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, and also what one of the things, and this was an eye-opening experience for me. I actually had a, a, a brother set. And one of the brothers wanted all the money up front. And the other brother said to me, if we don't structure this in an installment sale, my brother will blow through his money and he won't have anything because money burned a hole in, in the brother's pocket. Mm -hmm. And so the other brother was willing to, he saw the, both of them saw the validity in it, but the other guy just saw the big numbers and was like, oh, if I could open up my bank statement and see that money sitting there. And the other brother was like, no, if you do that, if we do that, I know I won't spend it because I'm, I will hold on to my money, but you'll go through it and you won't have anything. Right. And I think something that, that entrepreneurs need to keep in mind. And I personally went through this myself when I sold my first business is that a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in the internet space, we're bootstrappers. We, we uh, get yeah. things going and we do it with a lot of grit. And then when you come into a lot of money, you try and replace some of that grit with spending. And so yeah. the second startup is way more money thirsty than that first one. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get the right payout, and I've seen it happen with our clients and I had it happen with myself where that second startup 
flew through way more cash than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of a nice little uh, um, lever, uh, lever on that to, to make sure you're not blowing well, it's through also all. a safety net. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we see entrepreneurs who actually sell their business name and say, I'm going to retire. Mm -hmm. And that retirement lasts like a year. And then they're itching. They're like, w like, what do I, I got to go do something. I'm, I'm bored. I want to do this again. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I want to I go do this again. And so basically when we're going into our planning process, not every strategy is going to work for every client. But what we're doing is we're doing a full discovery and we're figuring out what's really important to that seller. And then we are working to, to mitigate taxes, you know, through the legal channels that are available so that they get the best deal at the end of the day. All right. I want to hit on one last thing on the notes that you yeah. provided me here because we didn't get a chance to talk about it. And that's the charitable strategies uh, yeah. section here. And we only have about five minutes left here. Yeah. So hopefully I, I'm not uncovering like an enormous topic that we could have spent. We could talk time. all day about charitable strategies. Well, maybe we'll do a secondary uh, a podcast just on that because yeah. that's something that's near and dear to my heart, making sure that as entrepreneurs, we're contributing where we should. But uh, where does this fall into the, the spectrum of planning? So basically... Um, Charitable strategies is one of the, the strategies that we use, and it's a foundation of tax planning. It's also a foundation of capital gains planning, and that's because charitable organizations can sell appreciated assets without paying tax on the gain. Oh, wow. So, it, again, it's a very, very convoluted type of strategy, but basically what happens is you actually establish a charitable remainder trust and you transfer that, those assets into the trust. It's important that there's there's no this is pre there's no binding contract before you transfer something into the trust. Um, the trust then sells the asset to the buyer, and that's where the magic happens because the trust is tax free entity. There's no capital gains, and then that trust then reinvests those assets um, from the sale price, and then it pays you the after tax amount over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's a way that we can eliminate um, we can eliminate a, a lot of taxation. Wow, that's that is absolutely mind blowing, <laughs> right yeah. there. You know, the, in in the the worry that that I think some people would get into is okay. I know we said this is legal. How much red tape and how fine are the rules that you have to follow for something like that? So basically, I mean, there are rules, and so but charitable remainder trust. I mean, you you have a legal team that actually specializes in this. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're not going to your, your mom and pop local lawyer who handles everything from drunk driving to, you know, <laughs> criminal, you know. My, my uncle who's a lawyer and not going to charge me a retainer, right? That, that right. type of a deal. Got yeah, it. Yeah. You're, I mean, so here's the thing. This is a place where when you're doing these strategies, you want expert advice. You want somebody who has done this again and again and again, and who, who understands these concepts. And so you're picking individuals that understand how to put together and to write a charitable remainder trust, how to facilitate these third party transactions. Got it. Okay. We are up against the clock. Shannon, how can people reach you? Because I guarantee mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of calls and a lot of emails from this. So uh, careful what you're giving out right now. <laughs> um, how can people reach you? So definitely they can reach me at advancedaccounting.com in the right hand button uh, corner. There's going to be a button that says a, a free consultation. And I would love to have a 30 minute Zoom call with them and just kind of talk them through what their particular situation is and if we can help them. That's fantastic. We will put that uh, in the show notes, a link over to uh, your, your website. We'll also upload this really simple uh, example that you put together of tax savings, which amounted to over $3 million in tax savings on a $12 million sale. Um, really, really interesting stuff. And I think the big lesson that I would like people to come away with is to think about this uh, about the the selling process in a little bit more strategic way because so mm -hmm. many people are just looking at let's get it simple let's get it done let's move on with our lives I'm going to eat this fee there's a lot that can be done by hiring the right people to reduce those fees you're one of those people uh, for sure that that can certainly help so thank you for coming on I can see having you on and maybe di digging deep into one of these strategies maybe in a future episode if we'd be yeah, up for it perfect. I'd love it Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.